Augustine, philosopher and saint, lecture number one. We are here to examine the most influential thinker in the Western Christian tradition. That's Augustine, or Augustine, if you want to call him that. That's a perfectly respectable way to pronounce his name. He is, to repeat, the most influential Christian thinker outside of the Bible itself. He influences the Western Christian tradition in so deep a way that all of us who are in the West, Christian or no, have in some way learned to think about ourselves and our world and God from Augustine. Many of the concepts we use to think about who we are are at root Augustinian concepts. For instance, if you think about the relationship between God and the self in terms of a deep inner presence of God, that's a thought that you owe directly or indirectly to Augustine. Maybe directly, maybe you've read Augustine, or maybe indirectly. Maybe you've been taught something like this in church, or maybe you've read, um, say, books by existentialists. It turns out that a lot of existentialist philosophy is unimaginable apart from Augustine. The themes of existential philosophy, like alienation, for instance, are deeply rooted in the way Augustine talks about the soul being far from the God who is properly deeply within. The inner self and alienation and wandering far from God and the longing for ultimate meaning, all that sort of thing which has been a key theme of modern philosophy and especially existentialism, for, in for instance, all that sort of thing is deeply rooted in Augustinian thought. So much of Western thought in general is rooted in this Augustinian tradition. Many of the people who write philosophy and theology in the Western tradition have read Augustine or have read people who have read Augustine or who have been taught by people who, who have read Augustine. So one way or another, Augustine's thought is all over the Western tradition. I've mentioned one key idea, and that's the notion of the inner presence of God. Well, here's another one. You've all heard of grace. Think of God's inner presence as an inward help that heals and guides and strengthens your soul. That's roughly what Augustine means by grace. And that's another one of those concepts which is deeply embedded in the Western tradition, and of course especially the Western Christian tradition. Or how about free will? We're so familiar with that concept, it rolls right off our tongues. But Augustine is, is perhaps the great theorist of free will. In fact, there are people who argue that Augustine is the first person to invent the concept of will, per se, as opposed to the concept of choice. People like Aristotle already had a notion of choice. But the notion of, of the will as a power of the soul, which is free from all external coercion, and which is really at the core of our soul and the core of all of our loves, and which goes beyond just sort of making choices and, and sort of beyond desire, but is a, is a fundamental feature of our souls, that notion of will may have been first conceived and formulated by Augustine. So a lot of the way we talk about free will is something we owe to Augustine. Or here's another one, what I will later call expressionism, the notion that there are these outward signs that signify what is deep within our souls, that words or gestures or a smile on your face reveal something deep within, that external and internal relationship where the external thing expresses or signifies what is deep within. That's another Augustinian concept which he developed in a deep, new theoretical way. So much of the ordinary way we think about ourselves in the Western world really is Augustinian. It's interesting that such basic concepts uh, that we use to think about ourselves have a history. And many times the history goes right back to Augustine. Okay, but the problem is there's also some themes of Augustine that are still familiar but less, um, less welcome, let us say. Many of the themes that have troubled and agonized the Western tradition also come from Augustine. Let me give you one prime example, the doctrine of predestination. If you've ever worried about this sort of thing, or if you know about, say, the, the kinds of Calvinists who were worried about whether they were predestined to be saved or maybe predestined to be damned, that's a kind of problem that you only get in an Augustinian framework. That's, that's a Calvinist problem, but it came ultimately from Augustine. And notice, Augustine believes both in free will and predestination. He believes in both of them. 
right? And he thinks that, that both are true. We'll have to talk about how that's possible a little bit later, but it gives you an idea of how rich Augustine's thought is, how complicated, and how it's given people an awful lot to think about. Because if you want to think about free will and predestination and how they can both be true, you're going to have a lot of thinking ahead of you. And you'll be thinking like a Westerner. And you, therefore, you'll be thinking like an Augustinian. Right? We have Augustine in our bloodstream in the Western tradition. Not just Christians, but of course, especially Christians, but also Jews, pagans, existentialists, atheists, or the whole bunch of them. We're all Augustinians in the West. Here's another one, another uncomfortable notion, um, very unpopular notion nowadays, sin, right? You're going to have to hear a lot about sin in these lectures. I hope that doesn't make you too uncomfortable, but if it does, well, it's Augustine that's making you uncomfortable and not me. But there are deep concepts of sin and there are shallow concepts of sin. Right? It's a shallow concept of sin if, if you think that sin is just sort of breaking the rules and being a naughty boy. Augustine has a deep concept of sin, I would argue. He thinks of sin as wandering far from home, wandering far from happiness, wandering in a region of darkness and unhappiness where we lose the thing that we love most. Sin is loving what won't make you happy and therefore loving what takes you far away from your true happiness. Sin is wandering, the agony of loss, the agony of grief. Sin is misery. That, that I think, is a deep concept of sin. It's not just, oh, you're a naughty boy, bad, bad for you. Oh, here's another one, the restless heart. Closely related, actually. At the very beginning of his great spiritual autobiography, The Confessions, Augustine says something very famous. He says, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Of course, the you here is God, and it's quite striking that in this autobiography, the word you is just as important as the word I. And our hearts are restless for that you. Augustine is one of those deep thinkers. He's thinking about the deep inner spaces of the self. And because he's interested in those deep things, he is deeply restless. He's not content with the way things are around him. He's not content with the visible world, the world of ordinary earthly life. He's restless. He's, <laughs> life on earth is not quite enough for him. He wants something greater and better and more eternal. That restlessness drives him and gives his writing and his work a great power and poetry, but it also is rather disturbing if you feel like you really belong in this earth. Augustine feels like where he is now is not his home. So obviously for Augustine, the organizing center of his thought is God. God as the goal of his life, his longing, his restless heart. We only get home when we can rest in God. And all of our love is driven really by that longing. And our love goes wrong when we love something other than God as if it could make us happy, as if it was eternal, as if real blessedness lay in loving something that will die. Love God and you will love a happiness that goes forever. Now, Augustine's pervasive influence has something to do with where he's located in Western history. He's located in a key transition point between the ancient classical world and the medieval world, a period that historians call late antiquity. He is born in the Roman Empire at a time when the, em the empire is Christian. Um, the Roman empires have been Christian. I'm sorry. The Roman emperors have been Christian for several decades at the time that Augustine becomes a Christian. Uh, Constantine is about 70 years ago. So he's a Roman. He's a Roman African. He's in the, the province of Africa, which is what we now call North Africa. He's born in Tagaste, which is um, in what is now Algeria. But that's part of the Roman Empire. Just like Algeria used to be part of France, right? Someone like Camus could be born in Algeria and think of himself as a Frenchman. Well, Augustine is born in North Africa, thinks of himself really as a citizen of the Roman Empire. He was raised 
on Roman literature. He was educated um, with, for, well, for instance, he learned to read by reading Virgil. He learned to speak by studying Cicero. That was how he learned and studied uh, public speaking. He inherits the riches of classical Roman culture. But on the other hand, he passes on to his successors in the Middle Ages a whole new layer of thought, specifically Christian thought. So he's this kind of hinge between the classical culture and the medieval culture. He, in fact, his, his, his career is located at the end of the Roman Empire. In his lifetime, Rome is conquered for the first time in history. The barbarians enter Rome and sack it and loot it in 410 AD. And when he dies, He's um, bedridden for several weeks in the city of Hippo in Africa, where he's bishop. And at the time, the city is under siege. And the Vandals are literally at the gates. The Vandals are a German barbarian tribe who are besieging the city of Hippo at the time. So the Roman Empire is coming to an end as Augustine finishes his career. And a new world is being born, the world of medieval culture. When the medieval thinkers and historians and writers look back at Augustine. They don't see a Roman, as Augustine often thought of himself. They see what they called a church father. He is a founder of a whole line of Christian thought. Now, the church fathers are a, a large group of people, a large group of, of very influential Christian thinkers. And Augustine is one of many, but in, in many ways the most influential. The Church Fathers are what I'll call authoritative interpreters of the Christian Bible. They gave us the, the, way of, the form of interpretation of Christian scripture that has become normative for most of the churches in later eras. Roman Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, all these churches owe their form of, of biblical interpretation and their, their mode of Christian doctrine to this group called Church Fathers. What, they, what the Church Fathers have done people like Athanasius and Ambrose, people like Gregory of Nyssa and Basil and Augustine, is they've made the transition from the sort of the stories in the Bible to doctrines. If you think of the Bible as a set of stories about, say, God and Israel in the Old Testament and Christ and the church in the New Testament, then what the church fathers are doing is they're reflecting on those stories and turning them into what we now call Christian doctrine. For example, in the New Testament, you hear about God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. And they're all treated as divine in some way. But it's the church fathers who take that sort of biblical way of talking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and say flat out, the Father is God. And the Son of God, Jesus, is also God. And the Holy Spirit, he's God too. And yet there's only one God. That's the doctrine of the Trinity, which we'll have to talk about at some length a little bit later. The Church Fathers formulated this and dealt with the, um, the difficult philosophical and logical consequences of identifying Father and Son and Holy Spirit as God and then saying there's only one God. You can imagine, this, is, this gets you into some philosophical deep water. The Church Fathers start having to use terminology that's not in the Bible. For instance, in 325 A.D., there is a church council in Nicaea where church fathers get together and they defined something crucial in the doctrine of the Trinity. They say that Jesus Christ is begotten of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father. The word essence is a philosophical term. You don't find it in the Bible. What it means is that Christ has the divine essence, that is, Jesus as the eternal word of God prior to his incarnation, has the divine essence or nature, just as truly as God the Father does, so that Jesus, in his divine nature, is truly God, just like God the Father. And that's, of course, what gets you into the doctrine of the Trinity. This confession that Jesus is of one substance with the Father is the centerpiece of what's called the Nicene Creed after the Council of Nicaea in 325. Actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. The scholars call the creed the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, which means uh, the creed that was formed at Nicaea in 325 and then completed 
at the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. And that's when you get the full creed that Roman Catholics and Lutherans and Episcopalians and Eastern Orthodox all confess in their Sunday services. Now, that creed was formulated and officially adopted by 381 AD in the Council of Constantinople. Five years later, in 386 AD, Augustine is converted and returns to the Catholic Church in which he grew up. He'd, be, he'd been a heretic in his youth, and in 386, he's converted back to being a Catholic, and he begins his career as a Christian writer. So, you can think of Augustine as inheriting the first crucial stage in the work of the Church Fathers. The Church Fathers are the sort of people who formulate the doctrine of the Trinity. And by the time Augustine gets on the scene, these Church Fathers have, in fact, formulated the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the crucial and fundamental Christian doctrine, because it's the doctrine about who God is, according to the Christian faith. So that doctrine has been put in place. It's a settled issue when Augustine gets on the scene. He will defend that doctrine at great length, but he doesn't have to formulate it, he doesn't have to agonize over whether it's true or not or how to say it, because that's already been said. What he does do is he relates that doctrine to his own deep philosophical concerns. And that's where a lot of the creativity and the creative tensions and maybe the contradictions in Augustine's thought come from. Let me see if I can explain that to you. What I'm suggesting is there's going to be a certain amount of tension and interest between Augustine's role as a church father on the one hand and Augustine's role as a philosopher on the other hand. As a church father, he's concerned with things like the doctrine of the Trinity. As a philosopher, he's concerned with the deep inner relationship between God and the soul. Now, you might think that it's fairly easy to relate the Trinity to the soul. But think about what happens, especially with this absolutely central figure we call Christ. According to the Church Fathers, Christ is God, right? That's an astonishing thing enough to say. About, about the most astonishing thing that Christians ever do say. And look at one astonishing consequence, okay? Um, he's truly God. And yet also, he's human, right? He's, he's a man. He was crucified and, and he walked around Galilee and all that. So this human being is God. Christians actually say that. They actually believe that if they believe the teaching of the church fathers who are the authoritative teachers of the early church. Now, if Christ is truly God, then his humanity, right, his humanness is the humanity of God. His flesh, his human flesh, is the flesh of God, right? And so what ends up happening is that the Church Fathers, in the year after Augustine dies, in 431 AD, there's a council called uh, the Council of Ephesus where a bunch of Church Fathers get together and they, they say, look, Christ's flesh, his human flesh, is life-giving flesh. This, is, this therefore becomes official church doctrine the year after Augustine dies. Now this is an astonishing thing to say because flesh is, after all, well, flesh without a soul is, is a corpse, right? It's dead. How in the world can flesh give life? It should be the soul that gives life to the body, not the body that gives life to the soul. So what the church fathers are doing is saying something very paradoxical. Christ's flesh is not something that needs life given to it, it is something that gives life to us. And of course, this notion of Christ's life-giving flesh is going to play a crucial role in later Christian understandings of the Eucharist, right? The, the ritual where Christians partake of the body and blood of Christ through the bread and wine of this Christian ritual. The idea is somehow that by eating this bread and drinking this wine, Christians participate in this life-giving flesh of Christ. So, you see what's going on. Is it something external, something fleshly and human, has life-giving power, divine power? Augustine wants to look at the inner relationship between God and the soul. He's the originator of a deep inward turn, I will call it. And yet, here the church has been saying now, there's this life-giving flesh, an external thing which gives us life. And although this doctrine had not been officially adopted until the year after Augustine's death, it's clearly a, a, a key thrust of Christian thinking.
So Augustine has to deal with that notion and preserve his inward turn. He's interested in the inner relationship between God and the soul. He, he wants to turn inward to look for God, and yet he's got to look to the flesh of Christ, to the sacraments of the church like the Eucharist, and to all these, and to the, the Bible, right, which is a set of external words. It's not inside your own mind. It starts out as, as words on a page, external words. So what do all those external things have to do with the inner self, right? The words of Scripture, the institutional church, the sacrament of the Eucharist and baptism, and above all, the life-giving flesh of Christ. Where does that all fit in to the inner relationship between God and the soul? That's going to be a tough question for Augustine. It creates, I think, some of the most interesting tensions in his thought. Let me illustrate that tension one more way. Early in Augustine's career, he is mainly working on some philosophical thoughts. Later in his career, when he's a bishop, he has to focus a great deal on, on Christian doctrine and Christian teaching, and, and his work as a church father really centers in the, the later part of his career. In his early career as a Christian writer, he's really working out a form of Christian philosophy, what I'll call Christian Platonism. That's a standard way of describing Augustine as a Christian Platonist. He's working on a philosophical conception of God and the soul. Here's how it works. He writes a book called The Soliloquies, not long after his conversion. Soliloquies itself is a word he invents. The word is soliloquia in Latin, and no one had used that word before Augustine. He makes that word up. He even apologizes to, to his readers for making up this new word. But he says, well, I, I need a word for something that I'm doing here because, in fact, it, what he's doing is something new. He's writing an inner dialogue. There had been philosophical dialogues written before, all the way back to Plato. But now Augustine's writing a philosophical dialogue which takes place inside his own mind. This is a new thing, so he needs a new word for it. The dialogue itself is astonishing. It's a dialogue between Augustine and a character that he calls Reason, capital R. It's a very strange and mysterious character. Let me show you how he's introduced, and, and this will get us back to that notion of, of inwardness. Okay, here's Augustine at the beginning of the soliloquies, and he writes, While I was turning over in my mind many different questions, seeking endlessly and diligently for many days for my own self and what is good for it and what evil should be avoided, all at once a voice spoke to me. Whether it was myself or something else inside me or outside me, I don't know, for that's the very thing I'm trying to find out. Well, reason then spoke to me and said, and then the dialogue begins. Right? This, this is a very mysterious character, this, this character named reason. Is it inside God? Is it inside Augustine's mind? Right? Is it his own reason? Or is it divine reason, eternal reason, speaking to him from outside his mind? Or what is it, really? And that's what he needs to find out. Because he needs to find out what's the inner relationship between his soul and God. And so reason is going to be his inner teacher who helps him find out about who God is, what the soul is, how they're related. But before they can do that, reason itself insists that Augustine needs to pray. Isn't that interesting? Augustine has to pray to get philosophical insight, and reason itself tells him he has to pray. So Augustine launches into a long prayer to the Trinitarian God, magnificent, beautiful prayer. And then at the end of it, reason, speaking to him again, says, all right, what is it you want to know? Augustine says, well, everything I prayed for. Well, tell me in a few words, says reason. I want to know God and the soul, says Augustine. Nothing else, asks reason. Nothing at all, says Augustine. Now think of that. If there's nothing you want to know except God and the soul, where does the life-giving flesh of Christ fit in? Not to mention Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and all those things that are terribly important for the Christian faith, and the Bible, and the church, and the sacraments. So it turns out Augustine is going to have to broaden his interests a bit. He's going to have to look at something besides just God and the soul. But he is going to re retain a deep interest in the inner relationship between God and the soul. So the richness of Augustine's thought is that he, he's the great philosopher of inwardness and he's the great church father articulating in a standard and very influential way the key Christian doctrines which will influence the Western Christian tradition for the next 1500 years. That's where 
all the, the interesting tensions and the deeply instructive forms of Augustine's thought can be found. Let me, in conclusion, mention a few points of terminology because I've been talking about the West so much that I want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear about this. I'm talking about Western Christianity. There is, in fact, a form of Eastern Christianity. Uh, we call it Eastern Orthodoxy. You think of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Churches. Those churches are not Western Christian churches, and they're not so deeply influenced by Augustine. Augustine is deeply influential in the Protestant churches and the Roman Catholic Church, but not in the Eastern Orthodox churches. You have to go back to um, the ancient Roman Empire to understand what's going on here. In Augustine's day, there were two halves to the Roman Empire. The eastern half, where they spoke mainly Greek, is the, the half of the Roman Empire where the Greek church fathers did their work, including in the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople, the Council of Ephesus. All of those took place in the Greek eastern-speaking half of the Roman Empire. And they became the basis for the Eastern Orthodox theology. Now, those uh, doctrines also got into the Western Church. But the Eastern Church doesn't have Augustine in their bloodstream. Augustine wasn't translated into Greek very early on, whereas a great deal of, of the, the Greek work of the Greek Church Fathers was translated into Latin early on. Augustine's immense influence, therefore, is confined to the successors of the Latin-speaking half of the Roman Empire in the West. That includes the Italians, Spanish, North Africa. That's where they spoke Latin in the Roman Empire, and that's the, the basis of what later became Roman Catholicism and Protestantism and all those. That's called the Latin Church. That's where Augustine is just immensely influential. Now, a couple more points of terminology. Um, I mentioned Eastern Orthodoxy. That's a, a, a name. Don't confuse it with Orthodox small o. Uh, Augustine is Orthodox small o, but not Eastern Orthodox. Likewise, Catholic. That's a really tricky one. When we say Catholic nowadays, we think Roman Catholic. I'm going to talk a lot about Augustine as a Catholic and, and also as an Orthodox Christian, meaning not Eastern Orthodox, but sort of Orthodox small o. And when I say he's Catholic, I'm actually meaning the same thing that uh, saying he's Orthodox. In Augustine's day, Catholic was not the opposite of Protestant because, of course, there were no Protestants yet. Protestants didn't come around until the 16th century. The opposite of Catholic was heretical. So I will call Augustine a Catholic, meaning he belonged to the Orthodox Western Church. He wasn't a heretic, of course. Um, well, heretics, let's put that aside for a moment. The point here is that if you're a Protestant and I call Augustine a Catholic, don't feel left out. When I say Augustine's a Catholic, I'm not saying he's a Roman Catholic. I'm saying he belongs to the ancient Western Orthodox Church, which is at the root of both Catholicism and Protestantism in our day. So whenever I'm talking about modern Roman Catholicism, I will say Roman Catholic. And most of the time, I'll be talking about this ancient Catholic Church, which is at the, the basis of both Catholicism and Protestantism. Now, back to the heretics. Right? When we say that Augustine is Catholic, that means he's not a heretic. Well, who says who's a heretic? Uh, um, well, for practical purposes, the people who say who's a heretic are the Catholics, because the Catholics are the mainstream. That is, the Orthodox Christians or Catholic Christians are the mainstream of the Western tradition, and their definition of who counts as a heretic is, is the one that is widely adopted. If it makes you uncomfortable to talk about heretics, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, when these ancient Catholics talked about heretics, the word heretic was just the word heretic was not just a nasty word for pagan or non-believer or something. Pagans and Jews and Muslims and all those sorts of people can't be heretics. Heretics are people who try to teach Christian doctrine and teach it wrong. For instance, if you tried to teach a doctrine of the Trinity that was wrong and, and, and sort of didn't really fully confess that Christ is God, then you would be a, a heretic. Right? But Jews don't try to teach about the, tr the doctrine of the Trinity and about Christ, so Jews can't be heretics, and neither can atheists. Only Christians can be heretics. So if you're you know, Jewish or an atheist or something, don't feel left out and don't feel like you're being called something nasty when I talk about heretics. I have to talk about heretics to talk about the world as Augustine sees it. On the other hand, there may be people in the audience who actually are genuinely sympathetic with Christian heretics. There's a lot of Christians around nowadays who are in sympathy with old-fashioned or ancient Christian heretics. The ancient heresies have a way of, of reviving 
If you're one of those people who feel sympathetic with the heretics, then um, there's a lot about Augustine that's going to make you uncomfortable. But that's all right. You might want to learn about this deep, important figure in the institutional life of the church, who's the one who makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with the institutional church, you'll be uncomfortable with Augustine, and you might gain some understanding of what makes you uncomfortable about the institutional church. The other side of it is, Augustine is not only this great authoritative figure of the institutional Catholic Church, he's also this explorer of the inner world. And almost every heretic likes the inner world. Right? So Augustine's an interesting, ambiguous, puzzling figure, I hope. Someone who's going to attract you in certain ways and make you feel uncomfortable in other ways. I hope you feel both ways. I do. Uh, I can't imagine not being attracted to some aspects of Augustine's thought and uncomfortable with others. You figure out which ones are which. But come with us as we explore the world of Augustine.